Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Today we celebrate what is called Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the most pivotal, most important memorial that we can have, and we're going to do communion to remember what Jesus has done for us before the resurrection. And of course, you know there is no resurrection without a crucifixion. It's the same with us. So as we come together, I hope uh, if any of you don't have a cup with you that wishes to participate, if you could raise your hand, we'll have uh, the deacons get you one. As is our tradition, we remember in the first of the month, the first Sunday of the month, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. The very foundation of our faith is based upon God sending his only son to die for us, to take the punishment that we have deserved, that we have earned. If you guys would take the top and just peel the uh, little cellophane layer off, you'll see a, a small wafer there. If you can lay hold of that. This wafer represents the body of Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, unleavened bread, a symbol of purity, and he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us so that we could be made whole spiritually have life. So as we look at the wafer, it's not much in the way of food. It's not a much to survive on. And yet the symbol is that Christ came, lived a perfect life and died in our place so that we might have new life. And taking of this little wafer doesn't produce any magical effects on you. But it does if in your heart you commit yourself to Christ afresh. Then it does all sorts of things. Why don't you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we remember your sacrifice. We remember how your body was broken on the cross. I thank you that you came willingly you offered yourself in keeping with the scriptures that we might have new life. I pray, Lord, that in our hearts and in our minds that we might sanctify you as Lord, as boss in our lives, that as we take it, that we too would follow after you. We thank you for the provision that you made for our sin and that we don't have to fear death any longer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You can eat. Now, if you would take the cup and peel off the top portion, well, the second layer of the top portion. Whenever we drink this this cup, I'm reminded in the Old Testament when God declared to Moses to instruct the people of Israel to place the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their, their dwellings so that when the destroyer came, when God came to take the firstborn, he passed over that house when he saw the blood. And it's the same with us. If we have the blood of Jesus on us, God passes over us. He knows, no longer sees our sin. He sees his son clean. And that's what we are. If you've come today and thinking that you have to clean up your act or do something and to get right with God, it's by faith and by faith alone in Jesus Christ and his blood 
cleanses us from all sin and God passes over us and we are no longer under judgment and we are justified. We are righteous only because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. Not anything about us. So if you have any burdens or you feel guilty, you lay that all on Christ and his blood by faith in him cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you gave your life for us and you bled and died for us. Your blood just cleanses us from all sin and forgives us of all our sin. We thank you for that and forever we remember you and what you've done for us. And as a body of believers, we, we drink and we remember you and we thank you. We all drink together. Well, winter's behind us. And it's starting to get really, really nice outside. And flowers are popping up and magnolias are popping out and cherry trees are blossoming. What a great time for God to come and send his son and bring him to life through resurrection. It's just the perfect time as the earth mimics what it is that God has done, or God basically is, is following along with his creation, uh, with what Jesus did for us. Uh, you can guess what today's message is about. Jesus? You're right. It's about Jesus. You're right. I don't know about you, but for me, I struggle every Christian holiday because I have to kind of sort through my heart as to what it really means, again, because it seems, it seems like the same story, right? Because it is. And yet, I always dig deeper and I want to find something more to it and I want to understand it. And, or else it just becomes this sort of thing where I can just, I can use the same PowerPoint I used last year and we just go over it all again. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I remember that last year. I remember saw that. And I don't, ever want to do that because I've sat where you're sitting and been very unhappy. And I never want any of you to be uninspired and not understand what it is that God wants for your life today. And so that's a very heavy thing for me. So pray with me. Father, this morning as we look into your word and we look at the reason that you came I pray, Lord, that it would mean something, that you might touch us on a deep spiritual, emotional level, that we might connect with you today, not just another day to punch our card and warm a seat and leave and forget all about it, not just another holiday, but, Lord, that today we would meet with you, that by your word and by your spirit, that you might meet with us. It's my heart's prayer, Lord, and our prayer together as a body. Help us to see you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. What great news that is. And what a terrible thing it is that the slide didn't show up behind it that I put there. If you can imagine the tomb, that's what it was. It's my fault. Human error, a great way to begin. And yet that's the problem, isn't it? That is why Jesus came, because of human error. Because we're all born in sin, we're born twisted, we're born broken, we're born selfish, we're born 
And we have all of these wonderful psychological names for all of our maladies, like megalomaniac, <laughs> obsessive compulsive, bipolar, <laughs> selfish, angry, lustful, boastful, proud. And that's the problem. And that is why we celebrate today, because Jesus came, died for our sins, and rose from the dead to show that death has no reign over him. And so that you and I have a hope that by following him that we won't die. It's the thing that everyone runs away from and nobody wants to talk about. It's a big elephant in the room. We're all going to die. That's why everybody's wearing masks. Everybody's afraid. It's funny. You can be outside walking, and if you don't have a mask on, and people do have masks on, they tend to go like this. <laughs> You'd be 10 feet away because people are afraid to die. That's the bottom line. Nobody wants to die. Although that's when our real life begins. But it's hard for us to understand that because we have such a grip on this world. We're placed so firmly here by gravity and all other things. Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, and we remember that today. We've been journeying from the cross to the crown as we went through and talked last Sunday about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and the palms and the clothes that they laid out and the, the, the donkey that he rode on and just the picture of a very humble servant coming into Jerusalem, certainly not a reigning king. And the people that welcomed him with Hosanna in the highest were crying out, crucify him, less than a week later. And so as we've been kind of following Jesus's path up to his resurrection, we finally get to the place where we can celebrate what it was that happened. Although it seems to me interesting that the day before Thanksgiving is called Black Friday, but when Jesus was crucified, it's called Good Friday. It seems to me a little sarcastic. And yet, without the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we would have no hope morally, because we would have to stand before God and be judged on the basis of our innate goodness, which on a scale from one to a thousand is a zero. So let's talk about what it is. It's not about the bunny. It's about the lamb. And of course, you know, the whole background of Eshtar, which we get Easter from, and you know, the the whole pagan background and the mixing with Constantine and, you know, of Christian and pagan religion and why it is that we celebrate with eggs and bunnies for fertility, by the way, if you don't know, you know, producing like rabbits is a term of people that have big families anyway. So you guys all understand that. And, and just even me saying the word Easter kind of, it's like giving birth to something I don't want to say. And yet, I think we need to take it back. I think we need to take back Easter. I think we need to take back the, the rainbow. I think we need to take back all sorts of things as Christians. And so I'm going to do what I can to get us into the word today. So why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? If, if you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't have a relationship with him, if you don't have a long-standing past in the church, that's okay. I'm going to walk you through it real, real slow and real easy. And we're going to take a look, but we're going to have to go back 800 years before Jesus even comes. We're going to go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah the prophet is speaking about the suffering servant who would come, the one who was prophesied to be the Messiah, the one that would die for the sins of the world. And he begins by saying, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, referring to the suffering servant, the Messiah, shall grow up before him, meaning God, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness or attractiveness. That when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he's not bound for Hollywood. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we 
hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, and he's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we are like sheep who have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. For he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? Or who's going to be able to hand off the story of what's going on here to his children? Because he'll have none. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked. But the rich in his death, because he had done no violence nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, by the way, that means offspring, and he shall prolong his days, speaking of resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So we see all of this written about Jesus about 800 years before he came and about how this Messiah would come and fulfill all these prophecies, taking upon himself the sins of the world. If you don't know anything about the historicity of Jesus, you you read this passage and it doesn't make any sense. And yet, when you read it and you understand all of these things were fulfilled in Christ, it's a tremendous thing. And it says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why would God be pleased with the death of his son? Because it means the purchase of you and I. That is the love of our God. And that is an amazing thing to me. So why did Jesus come? It depends on who you ask. If you go out on the street and you take a poll, you know, why did Jesus come? Uh, People will just tell you, well, he was an ordinary man like you and me. Why'd you come? Because your mother and father decided they were going to have a a night of of wild passion and suddenly you were were created. Well, that suddenly makes life very kind of empty and meaningless, doesn't it? So in Jesus' own words, I would like to tell you why he said he came. These are the words of Jesus. If you have a Bible and open it up, you'll find it all in red letters except for just a couple passages, and I'll point them out to you. But in Jesus' own words, he says this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. It's interesting. Don't we sing that at Christmas? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. Some people will tell you he did. Jesus says in his own words, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That last portion is somewhat natural, but. (laughs) Jesus says he came to bring a sword, and a sword is to cut, to separate. He could have said, I came to bring an ax. 
and it might be uh, appropriate as well. But he says he comes to turn all, everyone against everyone, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. I wanted to give you the rest of that passage. Because when, when you start, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you will separate. When you name the name of Jesus, it instantly sets you apart from the people in this world. And they will either be with you as family members or they will be against you as enemies. Jesus comes to bring a sword, which Jesus came to bring separation. If you've called on the name of Christ and if you believed in his sacrifice and you've accepted him as your savior and your Lord, then you have been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. Amen? Amen. Which means you're different and you're an alien in this place. That's going to set you apart. Jesus said so. In John 9, 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who may not see may see and that those who may see may be made blind. Jesus came to make blind people see and seeing people blind. That doesn't sound like a really awesome ministry, does it? I want to blind people. It's interesting, Jesus spoke in parables, and there was a point at which he just continued to speak in parables, and the disciples took him aside and said, Lord, you're speaking in parables. He goes, well, to you, the kingdom of God is being revealed through parables, but to everyone else, they don't get it. That's the Jersey version, okay? And then Peter says, that parable you just told, what the heck does that mean? Because <laughs> they didn't get it. And so Jesus had to explain, and so he does. He explains all of the parables, you know, the tares and the wheat. And he, it's a wonderful thing because he spoke, and those people that thought they could see were completely blind to what he said. And yet there were people who were blind from birth that Jesus would just go speak a word or he would touch them or he would spit in the dirt and rub it in their eyes. Isn't that wonderful? It's like, whoa, whoa, Jesus. Social distance, brother. What's up with that? You're going to spit in my eye? What's up with that? Except instead of infecting somebody, he healed somebody with it. Jesus came to judge sin in each of us. If we're going to be prideful, self-sufficient, think I'm going to stand before God because you know he's got a good man in me. And, you know, he picked, he picked a good person when he picked me to be on his team. I will, I'm confessing myself to be blind. And yet if I confess that I'm blind and I need a Savior, that's because I finally see. Jesus said in John 18, 37, it says, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born. You see, I picked out all these sayings that Jesus said, this is why I came. For this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You guys probably know the next verse. Pilate looks at him and says, what is truth? The people in this world will say, what is truth? Truth, by the way, is at a premium these days. There's no such thing as truth. There's just your opinion. Have you noticed that? Today, I identify as a German shepherd. <laughs> Therefore, if I bite you and tear your arm off, I can't be held responsible. I can't be held responsible for my behavior. Truth is no longer truth. Truth is just your opinion. Jesus said, I have come to be a witness of the truth, that there is a right and there is a wrong. And it's not for us to judge, it's for God to judge, and it's for us to listen. What is truth? Truth is what God says it is. He's the very definition of truth. Jesus came to be the truth, to be the visible truth of who God is and how he, what his character is. And we get to see him and accept him as our Savior and our Lord. In Mark 2, 16 and 17, it says, And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, 
How is it that he eats and he drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, the reason I'm with them is because they listen. <laughs> Jesus spoke parables to the Pharisees and he talked about two sons. There are two sons. One son says, Dad, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And he says, go out in the field and work. And he goes, right on it. I'm on it. And he goes out, and then he just doesn't. And then another son, he says, I want you to go out and work in the field with your brother. And he goes, no. But as he walks away, he goes into the field, and he actually does begin working. And Jesus asked the question, which one of those sons did the will of his father? And the Pharisees answered and said, the second one. And he says, I tell you, the tax collectors, prostitutes, will make it to heaven before you do. Because they were the ones that said, oh yeah, yeah, we love God, we're gonna do what God wants, and then they were doing whatever the heck it is they wanted to do. And it was about a performance. And a lot of people think that's what the church is all about. It's about people performing. It's about people being something they're not, or wishing, or hoping, or manufacturing some kind of an, an imagined God in their mind to serve. It sounds like somebody who's lost. The church isn't a museum for good people. It's a hospital for people who are broken. Amen? Amen. There's not one person in here who can say, You're, you got it down. I, I got my life down, man. I don't make mistakes anymore. I'm not angry. I don't have hurtful thoughts toward people. I don't get road rage. Yes. <laughs> it's a partial confession on my behalf. Couldn't even say it with a straight face. Jesus says, it's the tax collectors and sinners who need a doctor, and I'm there. And you know why? You, you have to be consenting for a doctor to work on you, don't you? You know, if, if you're bleeding, and the doctor says, hey, let me see that. No. Okay. No problem. I'll, I'll sign you out of here, but not, not, not with my care. I'm not taking responsibility for your sorry, bleeding self, Right? You've got, to, you've got to submit and trust somebody to do that. And it's the same thing with Christ. We've got to submit. So Jesus came to heal sinners. He came to speak words of life into their spirit so that their souls might become alive, which is a very different thing than just always being healthy, wealthy, and wise. In John 6, 38, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, the reason I came was to do what the Father sent me to do. And of course, you remember him in the garden as he prays, and he says, Father, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. You ever been in that situation where you know that you're called to do something that you don't want to do? You say, Lord, I wish, I wish you could just wipe the slate clean and I don't have to do this thing. Jesus knew fully what it was he came here to do, to give his life. And he submitted his will to his heavenly father. He came to be an example for us. Jesus came to be obedient. He came to be obedient to the will of his heavenly father. The one in whom Isaiah says it pleased him to bruise his own son. That's tough stuff. In Matthew 4, 23, and Jesus went around Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. So when Jesus came, everything he did demonstrated why he came. Did you know that everything that you do demonstrates your purpose? Everything that you do demonstrates your purpose. If you sit on the couch with the remote all day, that's what you think your purpose is. Jesus did all these things because it was in his purpose. He came to teach, to preach the kingdom and heal all kinds of people. Why? To demonstrate who he is. All of the healing was proof that he was who he said he was. 
There's no, there's no, dis, you know, when, when a man's hand is all shriveled up like this and in front of you, he heals the man and he stretches it out and it looks just like the other one all of a sudden. That's not a parlor trick. That's not a card trick. That's Jesus healing people. And it authenticated everything that Jesus spoke. Jesus came to preach, to teach, and to heal. You know, Jesus still speaks, and he still heals. Amen? If not, I wouldn't be here today. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus cast out demons. Number one, you got to know that they exist. And number two, you have to have authority to tell them what to do and where to go. Jesus did. If you remember when he cast out the demons of the demon-possessed men in the Gennesaret, and the demons cried out to be thrown into the swine, and he said, go. And he just said, go. No theatrics, no jumping up and down, no screaming and shouting. Just go. And they went. The guys who were watching the pigs were pretty upset about it. But why are there Jewish people herding pigs that are non-kosher? Hmm. Maybe Jesus needs to cast demons into some of the stuff you need to let go of. <laughs> Jesus sees the, the two demon-possessed men that are up on the hill, and yes, that's very much what they look like, I believe, from the Scriptures. And Jesus cast out the demons and they were in their right mind and Jesus asked for somebody's clothes so they could put some clothes on them. And they were in their right mind. The people of that area came and saw them that they were in their right mind and they say, oh, Jesus, you got to get out of here. In both those cases, Jesus, you got to leave. The people said, you, you got to go. We, we don't want you here. Too freaky. That's what they did. I think about Mary Magdalene, who was said of Mary Magdalene that seven spirits got cast out of her. Isn't it interesting? You don't have the story anywhere in the scriptures about Jesus actually doing it. But he cast seven evil spirits out of her. And she was a known prostitute. It's interesting. I wonder what rumors floated around Jesus' ministry as they traveled with a known prostitute. Do you know the liability of having a team like Jesus had? Jesus came to demonstrate his authority to us, the authority over the works of evil and demons themselves, his authority. Jesus says in 19.10 of Luke, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus says the reason that he came was to seek and save that which is lost. How many of you were lost? Amen. It's proof positive. He's still doing it today. He's rescuing us from ourselves when we were lost and he found us. When we were all on our own and we didn't have a moral compass and we thought we knew the right thing to do, but we ourselves didn't do it. When we knew what everybody else should be doing, but ourselves, we were lost until Christ came. And I knew in selecting that slide that it might be a mistake. We were lost, and he, as a shepherd of our souls, came and found us and brought us into the fold. Amen. And I'm so glad for that. So Jesus came to rescue us from ourselves. He didn't come to rescue you from the difficult life you have and from the other people that may have hurt you in your life and mistreated you. He came to save you from you, your worst enemy. Right? How many of you have been on a diet? <laughs> Say, I'm going to change. I'm going to work out. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop kicking people. Whatever your thing is. Jesus came to save us from ourselves so that sin no longer has power in our mortal bodies so that it doesn't tell us what to do. We're free in Christ because he came to free us. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. 
I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I thought Jesus was a celestial party pooper and God was just trying to poop on my party. He didn't want me to have any fun. He didn't want me to go anywhere. He didn't want me to do anything. He wanted me to be a monk on a mountain, you know, chanting, uh, you know, and that's what I thought a Christian was. Jesus said, I didn't come for that. I came that you might have life and life to the full. Like, understand your purpose. Understand why you're here. Understand why God created you. You aren't just some kind of a collision of atoms that came together in your mother's womb and you're accidentally here, some kind of a cosmic orphan. God has a purpose for your life and he knows you by name. It's time we get to know him in the same way, at the same level of intimacy. Like in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, I shall not lack any good thing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He makes me walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All of these things about God's provision for us. He came that we might have life. He's the very sustainer and provider of that life. And if we're not gonna stay connected with him, it begins to dwindle much like an umbilical cord that's been cut. And yet Jesus says he's come that we might have life and life more abundantly. Real life. You know, my experience with Christians over the years before I became one was that they are some of the most dour, judgmental, sour people I've ever met in my life. How can it be true that Jesus says I've come to bring life and life to the full. How could that be the case if there are so many people with those long faces? What's with the long face? There's no joy in your life. What happened? Is Jesus in your life? I'm just saying. Jesus came to give us real life, not where you get everything you want, but everything he wants for you and everything you can handle. I'm glad that I'm not a millionaire because I would misuse it. It'd be gone in no time. I'm not gifted in the way that God should give me a million dollars. And I'm okay with that. Just like I don't ride a unicycle. It would be death to me. In John 12, 46 to 47, Jesus says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus comes out with a call to everyone, those who might come. He comes with an invitation. He says, I'm not coming to be a party pooper. I'm not coming to be a judge. Oh, look what you did. Look what you did. Look what you did. You know, none of that surprises him. You know, you can't disappoint God. I'm sorry. You can't ever disappoint God. Because God already knows what you're going to do. Disappointment comes when you're like, oh, you can grieve him. But he's never like, go, go. Oh, look what you did. I had no idea. Wow, so disappointed. And yet, I don't know about you, but I always thought God was the judge who stood up there waiting until I just stepped over the line. He was going to throw a lightning bolt at me. How, how many of you have had that vision of God? How many of you had earthly fathers that were like that? Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we project onto our heavenly father the things that we learn from our earthly father. Jesus says, I haven't come to judge. I love this picture. Put your right hand on the best-selling autobiography and repeat after me. <laughs> the, Bi the Bible, you know, when, you, when you're in court, never mind. Jesus will be the one who judges humankind eventually. For the father judges no one at all, but he is entrusted all judging to the son, John 5, 22. But when Jesus came, he didn't come to judge. He came to heal. He came to help. He came to teach. He came to preach. He came to heal. But he will be our judge at some point. And we will have to stand before and give an account of the things that we've done in the body. That's what the scripture says. And the only thing that I'm going to stand in judgment for before God is whether I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and accepted the forgiveness of my sins by his shed blood. How about you? Everything else is academic. He's my defense attorney. 
I got an in. He knows the judge. So Jesus didn't come to judge the world, but that he might save the world. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring rebellion. I didn't bring to mess everything up. I came to fulfill the scriptures. Everything that you saw in Isaiah 53, he came to fulfill that. He was a man and God on a mission. And he came to fulfill that which the Father would have him do. Jesus came to keep his promise because it was the promise that he would come, that he would be riding on a donkey lowly and riding into Jerusalem exactly the time that he came and that he would be crucified. And he told his disciples three times, guys, he took them aside. Just want to let you know, we're going into Jerusalem. It's not going to go really well. And they didn't get it. None of them. They didn't get it at all. Jesus came for all of these reasons, but he came to die. And he knew that he came to die, and he did it willingly because he chose to. That is the most amazing thing about Jesus' coming. But he also knew, number two, that he was going to rise from the dead. In John 1.29, it says this, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. When he was baptized, he was said by John the Baptist, and John recognized he's going to be the guy who's the Lamb of God. He's the one who will be the sacrifice for the sins of the world, which is an amazing thing right at the beginning of his ministry, and two of the disciples decided to follow him. So you see, it truly is about the lamb, and it's not about the bunny. Jesus came to die for our sins. Who would you be willing to die for? Maybe a handful of people. Would you die for your worst enemy? Would you die for somebody who hated you? Who spat on you? Who wanted to kill you? Who hung you on a cross? Who mocked you? Jesus, even while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as he was on the cross, he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Could you do that? Jesus did. And he leaves a great example for us. Jesus says in 1045 of Mark, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And of course, the crucifixion is not something that we like to think about or even see depicted. But this is the cost of yours and my salvation and our freedom, is the torturous death of a perfect man and perfect God, that God came and submitted himself to these things, tempted in every way, even as we are, and yet without sin. He came to ransom our souls to pay what was due because we were slaves. So, Jesus came to buy us back from slavery. I don't have a right, you don't have a right, if we've accepted this great gift from Christ, to just live our life any which way we want to. Because we've been delivered from slavery. So I'm not addicted to anything anymore, praise God. There's nothing that controls my life anymore because I've been bought. I'm not a slave anymore. If you haven't come to that place, you need to understand that the power is there. You just need to find it in Christ. I mean, I, I could chew on celery sticks all day long, but I'm still going to want to eat that cheesecake <laughs> until something changes in my heart. And then it doesn't, I don't need celery sticks or carrots or anything else. And Jesus came to rise from the dead. He knew that he would experience death like he had never and experience all the pain that he had never experienced because he was put in a human body. It says, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise, Jesus said in Mark 10, 34. He was telling his disciples what was going to happen. He knew, as he walked to Jerusalem, he knew this was going to happen. He knew. 
and yet he did it. Jesus died and he rose from the grave for our hope. He did that that we might have a hope in him and a hope that when this life is all over and you breathe your last and you go for a dirt nap or whatever it is that you're going to do, that you'll be face to face with a heavenly father who loves you and sent his only son to die on your behalf. We in this life should have hope. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, great passage. I deleted it from here. We have hope in tomorrow because Jesus lives. In John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees, and they say, you know, by what power or authority do you do these things? Because their power and authority was being challenged by everything Jesus did, because he was the real deal, and he was doing things, and they were just talking about it. The Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? In other words, that's proof. And he had to show them a sign. So it wasn't like Jesus hadn't done anything. They wanted him to do a private little miracle for them. I want you to do what I say. I want you to write my name in the sky or something silly. Jesus answered and he said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Guess where he is? He's in Jerusalem at the temple. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. You see, Jesus said it, and they were like, I don't get it. Until it happened, and they said, that's what he was talking about. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it. He was talking about this temple. And he did it, just like he promised. And he rose from the dead. Death, where is your sting? Listen, the sting of death is the law, because <laughs> I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. I know there's, there's a moral perfection that's here somewhere, and I'm way down here. So what hurts when we die is that we haven't done enough. We're not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I haven't done enough good things. And I certainly can't outweigh my bad things with my good things. Because there aren't enough good things to do to outweigh your bad things because that's not how you outweigh them. It's only through the shed blood of an innocent that the Old Testament was able to have covering of sin. And it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us of our sin. Jesus died and rose from the grave for our hope. And I hope today you have that hope, that you know Jesus Christ, that you have a living, breathing, walking relationship with him, a conversational intimacy with God as your heavenly father and Jesus as your savior. Because that's the whole meaning of this holy week and of this season. And without that, we have no hope. And now, everyone who has heard this story and seen these words knows better. We're not held to account for the things we don't know. We're held to account for the things we do know. It says in John 3.16, for God, the greatest giver, so loved the highest sentiment, the world, the biggest audience, that he gave the greatest giver, his one and only son, the greatest gift, that whoever believes in him, the greatest leap of faith, shall not perish is the greatest punishment, but have everlasting or eternal life, which is our greatest reward. That's why that's the greatest verse. Pray with me as I um, ask the worship team to come up. Father, today we come before you humbly 
and we remember what it is that you have done for us by sending your son. We are humbled by the fact that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us. And you make the invitation that whoever receives you receives this relationship based upon the shed blood of your son that we have eternal life. Lord, I thank you for those that you have revealed this to. I thank you for those of us who you have redeemed. And Lord, any within the hearing of my voice who have not yet committed themselves to you, I pray that your spirit would be heavy upon them until they submit to your authority and find the life that is abundant and free. Lord Jesus, send us out with joy. Help us to remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.